Now let me start with your last point in the lecture about building institutions in Africa. There are two questions that I think have the same answer. The first question is, who are the beneficiaries of weak institutions? And who are men, who are those that are supposed to build the strong institutions? And I think the answer to both questions is the same. The governing class and the bureaucrats. So how do you build an institution in such a complicated setting? That's the first question. The second is on Nigeria. The country recently extricated itself from recession. And there is a widely held view that the recession was foiled by two forces. The first was the mid-2014 bust in world oil price and the regime change that followed the, 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 in 2015. And there was a currency crisis and the currency crisis was believed to make it uh, difficult for manufacturing sectors to access the foreign uh, forex to pay for imports of capital goods for its production and that was one of the things that led to the recession. Do you share this view? And if you do, what do you think a country like Nigeria that is rich in oil should do in anticipation of future shocks in the price of oil to avoid such happenings? Thank you. Well, those are both very good questions. The first. Let me say uh, that uh, uh, how, since, since it's government bureaucrats or people like us who are making a lot of these policies, how do how we make sure, you know, we all, uh, economists believe in incentives, so why aren't they making policies to benefit themselves? Uh, and how do we protect uh, society from that? Well, I think the answer, in some sense, uh, the most important thing is transparency in creating institutions that are the checks and balances. So let me give you an example. Uh, uh, more related to the United States, but it's, it's the same process. Uh, the president says, here, we're going to have a tax cut, and it's going to benefit everybody. But we have both within government and outside, and that's what's important. People who have the capacity to take that proposal and say, who are going to be the beneficiaries? Let's look at who's, how many people are going to increase taxes and pay, how many are going to decrease, where are they in the income distribution, where are they geographically? And you know what? It turned out his proposal is mainly beneficiary of the billionaires. <laughs> and of course he's going to say, oh, that's not true, but you know, you can analyze it. That is going to serve as an important check, hopefully. But you know, you can be sure, but an essential element is transparency and this accountability. Having the institutions that can check what is going on, who are the real beneficiaries? Sometimes it's ambiguous. You know, I don't want to, economics doesn't always have clear answers, but when they're not clear answers, there should be a open debate about why it is that people disagree. And uh, with that kind of open debate, we can see, you, you can flush out what is really going on. Somebody can say, well, why didn't you put this provision in? Oh, that's the reason. And you, you start understanding <laughs> who was, I won't say bribing the government, but who was making campaign contributions. One of the other aspects of the, uh, that, that in the past worked in the United States, there's a lot of questioning going on, but in the, we, we require disclosure of campaign contributions. Except, more recently, that law has not worked very well. So when we knew who was giving money, and we saw the coal industry gave a lot of money, and all of a sudden, there's no regulation on coal. Well, maybe we can see a connection between the two. So I think having real good uh, information about who is making what contributions and incidents, as we call it, who gets the real benefits, is, is really very important as a check against the kind of, of of uh, problem that you raised. Nigeria, and I don't pretend to be an expert on, on any individual country, uh, but from my understanding, uh, 
all the countries in the, or you would say most of the countries in the world that were oil exporters faced a very big shock when the price of oil went down. You can imagine if your income is largely due to oil of any good and the price of that good falls by 40%, 50%, you're gonna be in bad shape. Now, there are some countries, a couple countries, that managed it well. And what are those countries? Well, Norway, uh, how did it manage well? Well, partly it had, over time, used those revenues to invest in its people and diversify its economy. So um, one prime minister of Norway once said, you know, we took those oil revenues, we invested them in women, and we get more income now from women than we do from oil. <laughs> and the, so that's the first thing. Take, you know, diversify your economy and uh, try to create a stabilization fund so that when things go bad, you have something to draw on. But the other thing that Nigeria didn't uh, 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 manage well, it was exchange rate. And when you are um, an economy that is hit by a negative shock, and the oil price is a very big negative shock, what you have to do is lower your exchange rate, and that helps your manufacturing goods export more. It gets loud, it, 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 and what, what happened in Nigeria is they were, they kept the prices the exchange rate fixed, and then the revenues were down. They didn't have the foreign exchange to buy the imports that the manufacturing sectors needed, and you wind up in, the, in, in this, uh, this issue. Uh, uh, problem that, uh, of a recession. So uh, many, uh, say some of us warned Nigeria, try to talk to them and say, look at, you'll get opposition. The people who are going to buy Mercedes are not going to like to pay the higher price that they're going to have to pay for the Mercedes when the, when the exchange rate goes down. And they'll say it's bad for the economy. What their meaning is, I don't like my standard of living. When Mercedes are more expensive, <laughs> I don't like it. So you know you're going to get opposition. But again, it's a question of who benefits and who, who loses, a lower exchange rate would have created more jobs and uh, uh, would have helped their, I think, would have helped their economy a lot. Bob Berg, a former advisor to the UN Economic Commission for Africa and now with the Stimson Center. Thank you, Professor, for a semester's worth of brilliant <laughs> observations and recommendations. Um, the Trump administration recently, a few days ago, called for the bank to submit a new capital plan, which essentially would eviscerate uh, assistance to middle-income countries. And it does raise the question about what role uh, the external community should have, both for the poor countries in Africa and the middle-income countries in Africa, to help through these transitions that you just described. Well, I, I believe that the institutions like the World Bank uh, play uh, a very important role. The development banks play a very important role. Uh, and that's even true in middle income countries. And let, let me just say why I think uh, the Trump's administration policy here is, is, is basically very badly flawed. First of all, uh, the amount of capital uh, that is not, you, you, when, when, when the U.S. and Europe and other countries give capital, that capital is used as basically uh, 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 the basis of the development bank, of the World Bank, borrowing money from the market. And so most of the lending that goes to China isn't coming from the U.S. It's not like this money is coming from the U.S. It's, provided, it's providing confidence in the bank and given the rules of the institution, it allows it to go to world markets and say, uh, we can borrow 
and, uh, at, at allows them to borrow at a reasonably low rate and then lend on. Now, the case of China is a very interesting one uh, because China is not borrowing from the World Bank because it needs the money. It's sitting on $3 trillion. $3 trillion. So do they think that if they tell China you can't borrow from the World Bank, China is going to go bankrupt? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, China could go ahead with every one of its development projects without the World Bank's money. But why does China want the World Bank there? It wants the interchange of knowledge like we're having today. You know, I, I, I go to China a lot. Uh, they want to learn. You know, China was part of this East Asia miracle, and they know that uh, 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 there is expertise. And that's something Trump doesn't seem to understand. There is expertise <laughs> in the world, and you, you want to bring the best thinking. What have, we, what have we learned about how to make inclusive economic growth, inclusive agriculture? What has failed? What has worked? And that's where the World Bank plays an important role within the world and where the African Development Bank and the African Export-Import Bank plays an important role in Africa. By going from country to country, you learn about the success, the successes in Ethiopia or Rwanda or other countries, and you know how to apply them in other situations, or at least you can say, Here, here's something that's been working in one country or another. That's what China wants. Because in the end, China is going to make its own decisions. You know, it's not like structural adjustment where it's imposed on it. <laughs> it's going to make its own decision, but it wants the knowledge. And it's actually related to the previous question. It wants to make sure that the judgments that its bureaucrats are making are consistent with judgments being made by other people in other countries where the other bureaucrats, you know, so it's not serving some special interest within China. So it's actually part of the checks and balances that China, I think, that it uses to, to ensure that the development strategy is consistent with what it wants to achieve. So I think it's a, a, a very big mistake. The consequence, again, they don't understand the way the World Bank works. The consequence is that the, there won't be a capital increase for the World Bank, and the World Bank will become increasingly small relative to the global economy. And what is going to fill in the gap? The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, and so America's influence will become diminished. So it's not like it's helping us versus China in a competitive uh, framework. It's, it's actually going to be hurting the United States relative to the rest of the world. And it's a, just another example of a, uh, well, I won't say it, have I? <laughs> <laughs>
Amayarta Sen in terms of social and economic uh, injustice and reform, I think about these Bretton Woods countries and as you say, the deindustrialization of Africa. How, as I'm gonna call you a New Keynesian, and I know that you're supportive of Georgism, how does Africa, seeing how it's a continent, like fight off the multinationals and China in pursuit of those commodities? Like what are they going to pursue since it is a series of countries and a continent in line with your government support? Sure, so, so um, some of this, uh, I think it, is going to have to occur collectively. In other words, it's very hard for any single country to stand up to the multinationals. I think there has to be sort of an understanding within Africa, and not only within Africa, with Latin America, with, with Asia. And, and I talked a lot, and I think there, there's now, even within Europe, an understanding that, and even within America, that there's been a loss of a balance of power. Uh, a loss of balance of power that we talked about in the United States in 1890, big trust, you know, Rockefeller, uh, sort of began distorting our economy, U.S. Steel and, and all those big trusts. We passed antitrust laws and we said we have to restore balance to our economy, and then that was continued with so called the progressive era, and then there was uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and so, so w there was a, a, a fight for half a century to restore the balance. And to a large extent, it worked. Just to give you an uh, example, uh, the share of the top 1% in national income went from around 20% down to under 10%. But now since 1980, it's gone up to 20% again. So we fought this concentration of economic power, we won the battle, and then we lost it. So even within the United States, there's this battle going on now of how do we get these companies to pay their taxes? You know, how do we get, the, how do we uh, stop this exercise of market power? How do we strengthen worker power? And so, so, uh, so to me, one part of this is collective action. And um, the, this is not an easy battle. Let me give, I was in Addis Ababa uh, um, for the UN uh, Development Finance Meeting uh, was it a year ago, a year and a half ago in, in, in August? Uh, I mean, in, in, in July, in July, a year and a half ago in July. And there was a big battle there over uh, reforming multinational taxation. And India was leading the way for, on behalf of the developing countries. Uh, India said, we need to have a global framework within the UN for rethinking taxation of multinationals. And uh, the United States took the view that the United States and the other advanced countries should take, be responsible for the taxation of multinationals. <laughs> well, you know where the outcome of that would go. <laughs> so, so that, it was, it was the one issue, by the way, which kept the uh, debate going at Addis for about three days. They couldn't reach an agreement. And finally, the United States won. And the world lost. <laughs> but uh, the, the battle still is going on. There is a huge, uh, I'm, I'm uh, in a, what is called an independent uh, commission for uh, reform of uh, taxa taxation of the multinationals. Uh, European countries are now getting very involved because what they see is that the big multinationals are not paying them any taxes either. <laughs> it was one thing when they didn't pay Africa taxes. That was okay. But when they stopped paying taxes in Europe, that, that's, uh, uh, that was unacceptable. And uh, so there is a lot of 
discussion and uh, about this issue, and I think, I think uh, within the next few years, I think we're going to see that that change uh, because they overreach. The multinationals overreached, and uh, um, and so uh, I well that's that's to me. It, it's going to have to be done collectively. But the more that that Africa can hold together on this issue, uh, the better it will be. Thank you. I'm wondering whether you would comment on the aspiration of Namibia to wipe out poverty. Uh, President Hagi Gangab says he's going to do that and has appointed a, a minister of poverty eradication. And do you think this is possible? There's been lots of criticism that you shouldn't even think that boldly. What would the AFRXM yeah. Bank say? I think I think it's a good thing to think boldly. Okay. I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think what Namibia has done in many respects uh, is very impressive. Um, in uh, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that I found uh, was very striking. I was up at the very north of Namibia in, in the desert there, and people come across from Angola, which is a rich country because of all the oil, with all the oil, to get health care in Namibia. Uh, so, you know, they've created a, 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 a health care system. You know, it's not the same level of health care you would have in a Vang's country, but they have done a great deal, from what I could see, in, in, in providing a... a health care for the people and providing education. They've, when I mentioned before, a country that has been, that has a lot, na has natural resources, but made a lot of the successful transition to a service sector. They are about 60, 70% or 80% service sector. So they've, they've made a lot of that transition for high end, uh, particularly high end tourism. Uh, um, where they, they have some, very poor groups in their society uh, who are in not just poverty, but deep poverty. And so I think when people say, can you get rid of poverty? I think the answer is yes. Uh, but it will take resources. And um, it may not be achieved in three years, when, five years. When the UN announced the Millennium Development Goals uh, in 2000 of cutting poverty in half in 15 years, uh, a lot of people said that was crazy. You know, it, it was beyond the reach. It was, you know, it was aspirational. Actually, the world achieved it. Um, so to me, it seems to me that having that goal there and having various civil society groups within Namibia identifying the people that he has not yet brought out of poverty is going to be, going back to one of the earlier questions, part of the checks of going on and ensuring that the growth that occurs is going to be more inclusive. One of the things that Namibia has also done is that it's been very supportive of a free press. And I believe that's very important. And uh, the president you know, talked to me about that and he said, you know, he had fought against uh, South Africa for independence and, and for freedom. And he said, you know, with, with a whole set of values that, that's meant by free, freedom. And he said, how could he, after having fought for freedom, not ensure that there's a free press? And he, you know, he just saw that as, as an essential element of their successful development strategy. Uh, one more story. Let me tell of, of th that he said that that I thought was very very interesting. That that he said that uh, whenever he has a special interest that comes in and wants something from him, he always invites some of the press in, <laughs> and he says it has a very chilling effect on their requests. Uh, <laughs> so I think the press, a free press, can be a very important part of the system of checks of holding him accountable for that aspiration. And what's the view of uh, Mr. Obama and the African Bank on poverty eradication? 
Well, you're asking me uh, an obvious a question that has an obvious answer. If I said it wasn't possible, then I'd lose my job. <laughs> so, uh, the, reason, the, reason, the reason we are here is to make sure we eradicate poverty in Africa. So anybody who makes it, uh, any government that makes it an objective will have our full support. <laughs>